And let's continue taking a look at the economic and social programs they brought into India, especially during the Nehru period. Policies to improve the position of women. Uh, traditionally, women aren't doing great in India. Um, they were subservient, meaning they uh, kind of had to be lesser to men. Uh, men could marry several several wives, while women had no right to ask for divorce. So a man could have ten wives, and the women had to just, they pretty much tolerated. She couldn't do anything about it. She couldn't get out of a bad situation. Uh, daughters received a dowry when they married, uh, but, ex but they were excluded from a right to inheritance. And so women were then always dependent on men. And so the whole idea of dowry is the idea that uh, if you want to marry this woman, uh, the family or the, the father of this daughter needs to provide some extra incentive to get somebody to marry her. And so this is going to include possibly a cash bonus or a house or something, some extra incentive to get a man to marry the daughter. And so therefore, this is more of a business decision. There's not a lot of love involved here and in that we get marriages based purely on prizes. And then the daughter, she's completely excluded uh, from inheritance. So if her father was rich, hey. Uh, the father could put up a million dollars to any husband that's willing to marry that daughter. And then that million dollars goes directly to the husband and the daughter gets nothing. And hopefully it's a good husband, but there's no guarantee. And so it's a messy system. Uh, this is not saying that all marriages were bad, uh, but it's uh, there are some serious issues uh, when it comes to the bad marriages and what a woman could do. In rural areas, a woman moved into the home of her husband's family where she was often subject to oppression and control by this new family. Very few women, few women were allowed access to education. In 1951, less than 8% of women were literate compared to 25% of men. So these are the issues that they need to tackle and deal with, work on, to improve the lives of women. Independence brought a lot of changes for the status of women in that Gandhi and Nehru encouraged women to participate in the fight for independence. They were in the marches and they were always there helping to lead this fight for independence. And women were some of the first ministers and provincial governors in this new government. A constitution guaranteed equality and the right to vote for all women. And we saw it very early on in that they had a female prime minister, Indira Gandhi, pretty early on throughout the 60s. And so Nero worked hard to promote and ensure that women had equal rights. 1950, they pro he produced the Hindu Code Bill. It includes reforms for marriages, divorce, inheritance, and property rights. Yeah, it didn't work out. The Hindu traditionalists, like the BJS and other communalist groups, the, these groups that want to split and just fight for their certain little right, and a very conservative Congress, including Patel, uh, rejected the bill, and so Nehru just withdrew it because he knew it was a loser. It's not going to work out. After Patel's death, it was Nehru's number two. After Patel's death in 1950, Nehru then had enough support to slowly introduce these reforms as separate laws one by one. And so instead of one big Hindu code bill, one by one he's going to slowly bring in these ideas, including the Hindu Succession Act. This gave women equal rights for inheritance and owning property. So women can own property. And if their husband dies, they get that property. It doesn't automatically be passed on to the next male. If their father dies, they have a say in that inheritance now. The Hindu Marriage Act. This abolished polygyny. Uh, it's like polygamy, but it's just men. And so this means uh, a man cannot marry multiple wives. It provided maintenance for a wife if her husband divorced her. So this is kind of alimony payments. And so if uh, there's a divorce... And the woman has no job. She has no way of getting a job. The husband must provide for a few years until she's able to get up on her feet. Same way it is here. And it also gave women the right to sue for divorce. So women now have the right to divorce as well. 1961, the dowry system is abolished. And so this whole system of okay, giving women away okay, for prizes is abolished. Results of these reforms, it's mixed. Not great. In rural areas, it's difficult to change these very traditional attitudes. This is the way it's been for the last thousand years. 
Uh, the educational opportunities did improve for girls, but it still lagged behind boys in rural areas. So it got better, but uh, it still has got a ways to go. Uh, decades later, the literacy rate of women still lagged behind men. So they're still working on catching up. It's improved, but it's not equal. Women did become more politically active. 94% of women were registered to vote for the 1957 election. However, by the next election, a lot that number dropped down. So it, uh, when it comes to the status of women, the government started to work on programs to help them, uh, but it's still got a ways to go when it comes to changing the attitudes uh, of the average person. The caste system, minorities. Caste system, we've talked about this a bit already, originated 2,500 years ago, divided society into a hierarchy of levels, including the untouchables, or Dalit. This was associated with Hindu tradition um, because it's so old, India is so mixed, uh, the practice is also used by Sikhs, Muslims, and Christians in India. And it was used as a way to legitimize unequal access to resources and to exploit the lower caste to kind of pe to keep the lower people down, below others, and to make the upper people have certain status and keep that status. Untouchables were subject to legal discrimination. They were not allowed to own land. They were not allowed to enter temples, use village wells or even use the same roads as upper status people. They were the ones that did the hard labor, including carrying water, uh, tanning leather, and farming usually as sharecroppers because they couldn't actually own the land, they had to rent the land. They were banned from going in the same hotels and restaurants in the cities. New restrictions were added in the 1930s, including a prohibiting literacy. They're not allowed to try to learn to read. A ban on the use of certain clothing items like umbrellas, which were seen as something only for the rich. And so these are all legal, these are all laws passed specifically to keep a certain segment of the population down. And so how do they work to fix this? The number of untouchables really varied in different regions, but were much higher in the north as the population is higher in the north. 15 to 20% of the population uh, were part of the Dalit, the untouchables, before independence. Gandhi spoke out against this discrimination of untouchables, and several movements were formed to fight this discrimination. B. R. Ambedkar became the main leader of the fight to end this system. After independence, the caste system was still very strong and dominated rural life. Congress leaders who supported modernization and change opposed the caste system as a cause for division in all of India. Conservatives saw the system as tradition that shouldn't be changed. This is the way it's always been. It, it's maintained stability, and that it also provides and keeps these groups separate. 1950, the Constitution says no. It gives equal rights to all, regardless of religion, race, gender, language, or caste. So the caste system is abolished, including the idea of untouchability. 20% of parliamentary seats are reserved for former untouchables in the forest tribes. They are known as scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, so they are guaranteed certain seats, a certain representation in Parliament. Untouchables were now guaranteed equality in law and as voters, and were free to use the same shops, schools, and temples as any other citizen. So according to the law, they are equal. And they also included money to work on this. Five-year plans included money for untouchable aid. Wells were drilled. And water wells were drilled for untouchables in areas where citizens refused to share water with them. So even though the law said they're equal, it takes a while for the people to change their views. And so in some areas, they weren't allowed to use the same well because of this worry that because they are a lower caste, they might make the water dirty somehow by touching it or using it. And so the government started to drill separate wells for them so they can get water too. They were given special land allotments for settlement. They were given you know, chunks of land they were now allowed to own. They provided access to housing, health care, and legal aid. To encourage education, they were exempt from paying school fees. They were given special access to uh, housing, hostile housing, and scholarships to you know, some of these schools. However, by 1960, their literacy rate was still only a third of the average of India, so they still had a ways to go, baby steps. 1955, to really make sure that they are treated equal, treating people as untouchable became a criminal offense. However, it becomes really hard to prosecute. Very few people were prosecuted. Discrimination continues to this day. It's, it's gotten better, 
but it's still got a ways to go. Policy is to create a more equitable distribution of wealth. Five-year plan goals included the eradication of poverty. They want and the, this idea of poverty gone. And the improvement of the standard of living. They want all of India to rise up and become stronger together. The goal of economic growth with equity, with the idea that higher growth would make greater equity possible. If they have more money, they can share more of that money with the people and bring the whole nation up. Other strategies for equity included land reform, greater access to healthcare and education, which we've seen, and eliminating inequalities of gender and caste, which we've always seen. So these are all strategies to help bring India up so that more people are making more money. Land reform is one example where this would free peasants from domination by landholders. So legislation reduced the amount of land that would be held by the Zamandari, the landowners of these huge estates, these giant farms. Wealthier peasants, however, benefited the most, while the position of poor and landless peasants didn't change. And so you had these huge landowners, and some of that land went to some of the peasants, and those peasants became wealthy, but there's still a huge segment of the population that has no land. Uh, Congress didn't change land reform. They didn't want to go too far and take all the land from the rich and give it all to the poor. They didn't want to go full communist. They want a mixed system because they also didn't want to alienate the wealthy. They didn't want to hurt the rich they to help the poor too much. They want to mix. Wealthier, wealthier peasants benefited from the rural development projects such as the Panjayari Raj by ensuring their elections for local council, thereby dominating local decisions and funding. And so the rich, richer peasants, uh, in that they're, we, we would define this as middle class, were able to have a little bit more power. Despite the intentions of Nehru, his work did little to eradicate inequality or poverty for the landless villagers. So it, uh, despite his work, it helped a little bit, but it is still a lot to go to. If India, if India's land was divided like India's wealth, this chunk would go to the top one percent. Okay, nine percent, they would own twenty-five percent of the land, forty percent this, fifty percent this, and so it's still not quite equal, especially with this one percent here owning a huge chunk of the land. And so that was a look at the economic and social policies that India implemented to uh, change.